It's interesting. The open source world is a great way to get to users and get to developers. It's very hard to monetize. And that's probably the one thing that people get the most confused on is how do you build a business model around open source? But in the long run, I just think this model is where the market's going. I think open source is real. You know, organizations are contributing to it. People are willing to do almost anything as an open source project. So I think I think it's going to be harder and harder to have proprietary software companies in the infrastructure space unless you have just incredible breakthrough technology. You're listening to the Enterprise Ready Podcast, a show aiming to change the enterprise software narrative from how to sell to enterprises to how to build for enterprises. We'll interview industry experts and enterprise software founders as we break through the jargon, establish a common vernacular, and share the lessons learned from building the world's best enterprise software. Hi, I'm Grant Miller, creator of Enterprise Ready and founder and CEO of Replicated, where we enable cloud-native software vendors like HashiCorp, CircleCI, Sneak, and many others to operationalize and scale the distribution of their modern on-prem applications. Check us out at replicated.com. The Enterprise Ready Podcast is brought to you by Heavybit, a program dedicated to helping startups take their developer products to market. For more information, visit heavybit.com. If you're interested in being a guest on the show, or if you'd like to suggest a topic, or just learn more about enterprise features, find us at enterpriseready.io. In this episode of the Enterprise Ready Podcast, I'm joined by Shannon Williams, co-founder of Rancher Labs, and now CRO at SUSE after their acquisition of Rancher. Shannon is well known in the cloud native and open source communities for his work on early cloud frameworks, and most recently in the Kubernetes ecosystem. Our discussion starts with Shannon's beginnings in enterprise software, working in sales and marketing for a handful of security companies in the Bay Area. These early lessons in enterprise sales would eventually serve to be a blueprint for the way Shannon approached pricing and packaging for both his future startups, Cloud.com and Rancher. As a pioneer of infrastructure as a service, Shannon identified the industry's need for containerization early after running massive automation stacks with CloudStack, a VM management platform Shannon helped to create while at Cloud.com. This leads to a discussion about the founding of Rancher in the early days of Docker, and as Shannon puts it, trying to sell tires to a car that doesn't exist. We then talk through open source business models with a focus on Rancher's support-based offering. Shannon highlights the mutual trust that must be established between a vendor and their customers to ensure long-term success with this model. Some of my favorite insights were how they augment support with technical account management that focuses on communicating with customers beyond break-fix issues and his advice for starting a customer advisory board as it led Rancher to identifying their most valued champions. This episode was a ton of fun to record and it let me dive into some of my favorite things to nerd out about. I hope you enjoy. All right, Shannon, thank you so much for joining. Thanks, Grant. It's exciting to be here. Cool. Let's dive right in. Tell us about how you got into enterprise software. I've been in enterprise software now since the late 90s. I had my first job out of college. I actually was a journalism school graduate. I, I wanted to be a reporter kind of growing up. And when I came out, I sort of pinged around looking for interesting jobs. Being a kid from the Bay Area, all of the most interesting ones were in tech. I, you know, I, I, The first one I found was at this funny little accounting software company up here in Marin where I live. That wasn't a great fit <laughs> to say. It was kind of like, uh, it was very old school, kind of open source accounting software, if you can believe that, back in the 90s. That's cool. But right away, I found a, a really interesting job working for a company called Securant Technologies in the city that was focused on some of the earliest identity management and access control software for the web back in 99. And I just sort of took off from there, getting to work on initially a lot of security companies. I worked in that company did really well and ended up being bought by RSA security. And then I went to another company that did like the first web application firewall. That one ended up becoming part of Citrix, you know, went on to work on host intrusion prevention systems and Actually, I started mostly in marketing as a journalism grad writer. Mm. I got into marketing and demand gen and then, you know, picked up inside sales. And before I knew it, I was I was kind of craving to start working on the customer side and working more closely on building the companies. By 2008, I met up with my co-founder, Shen Liang, who was just getting ready to start a company called Cloud.com, which was one of the first players in, you know, enterprise cloud computing software, so infrastructure as a service software. And uh, in cloud.com, we started that in 2008 and you know had a, a really amazing run with that company, building that up. And 
that led us uh, to getting acquired by Citrix again, second time, and spending about three years at Citrix before we started Rancher in 2014. So I've been working in a lot of ways with the same team on enterprise software for 12 years. Um, the same co-founders, same head of engineering, a lot of the same salespeople and marketers. It's been great. It's funny. Sometimes I feel like I'm, I'm always working on startups and new things, yeah. but so often working with some of the same people. So it's, uh, it's exciting. It's definitely a cool time to be working in enterprise software because so many people are, you know, they're, they're actually seeing this as a career they want to be in. So we got young people sort of pushing to get in, pushing to join our company. And that's been a lot of fun. So yeah, it's been a crazy journey. One that's kind of touched a lot of marketing and a lot of sales. But for me, I'm so glad I lucked into it. I never thought I would end up in this market. But one of the great things about being a kid from the Bay Area is you can't turn around without bumping into jobs in, <laughs> in enterprise software. And so how did you meet your co-founders that you've been working with? Well, it was interesting. I had been over in Europe. The company before uh, we started this was headquartered in the Bay Area. And I, I started with them in the Bay Area. And the CEO asked me to go over and be the head of European sales while I was there. And that was a company called Solid Core Systems, which ended up being acquired by McAfee. And... Um, I spent two years over in the UK building up the sales organization there and kind of, you know, learning a lot for me, learning a lot of the chops of how to do sales, how to do enterprise mm. sales. And then I came back, the economy kind of crashed. It was 2008. It was like I was sitting over there and the, you know, the organization was falling apart. So we decided to cut out a lot of what we were doing in Europe. My visa was up. So it was kind of time to look for something else anyway. So I moved back and the CEO of that company that I had actually moved over to Europe for, you know, he said, Hey, I don't know what we're going to have, but my friend is starting another company. I think you should go meet with him. And that was Shang. And it was funny because Shang and I had actually crossed paths at an earlier software company where he had been a founder, but left before I joined. So I knew of him, but I didn't know him, but we knew a lot of the same people. So we had this great connection through the CEO of that company and, and a couple other founders that I had worked with at another company. So we sat down and you know, it just hit it off really well from the beginning. And and at the time, you know, Amazon was like a year old, you know, AWS and the early parts of, of cloud computing were being built. And, and he was really, you know, excited about the potential of building effectively a software platform that mirrored what Amazon did, but could be run anywhere. And that, you know, when you think about it, it's sort of the, the genesis of a lot of what we've been doing that that ended up being CloudStack. The product we built there was called CloudStack. And that then led to OpenStack, which was an open source project that ended up competing with CloudStack, but also, you know, kind of being heavily influenced by what we did. And before we knew it, we were off and running. We got acquired right around the same time OpenStack started to get steam. So mm. we were kind of, we had done really well, grown really fast. And then, you know, Citrix, which was one of the founders of OpenStack, acquired mm. us to sort of drive their OpenStack vision and kind of bring it all together. And that ended up being, you know, an interesting challenge, sort of living inside of a company that had one vision and trying, you know, they were primarily a desktop computing company trying to get into enterprise software, uh, or at least enterprise infrastructure, which is a little different than where their strengths were. And so we spent about three years there working on that project, but it never really took off inside Citrix. And at the same time, you know, we were seeing some of the challenges that would come to plague OpenStack down the line, which was building these big, fully, you know, enterprise platforms based on virtualization and storage and networking was a lot more than most organizations could handle. And I would say by 2013, 2014, it was pretty obvious that that level of IT investment and building up massive automation stacks was probably not going to be the, the future, right? More than likely, you would have cloud dominating sort of infrastructure and potentially something much easier coming along. You know, we were even running into at the time sort of the need for containers because we were already dealing with, you know, one of the large banks who was running a large cloud stack deployment on premise and trying to figure out how to move workloads between that and the cloud. And, and I remember playing around with very early versions of container software, even before Docker. Mm. And then 2013, Docker kind of springs into being. And, you know, it became really obvious very quickly to Shang, uh, Darren Shepard, my other co founder that there was a really interesting opportunity here to build a new layer that was much more portable, much easier to implement and could be implemented anywhere. It didn't require hard infrastructure. It could be implemented right on top of virtualization, right on top of the cloud as a new abstraction. And that led us to start Rancher. And 
you know, from there, you know, we started, luckily we'd had a lot of success. Our previous company had done really well for its investors. So we had kind of the benefit. The first time raising was brutal. You know, I can tell you going and raising money back in 2008 in the middle of, you know, for cloud.com. Oh yeah. This is like RIP good times, right? That Sequoia deck that, yeah. It it was brutal, man. We were, we must've talked to 30 VCs and, uh, you know, we had uh, Redpoint, a, a good friend of Shang's, had just become a partner there, loved Shang, had worked with Shang, was like, you know, we're in already. So we, we already had one, just getting one more because they just needed another company to kind of set the price. Mm. And finding that second one it was so challenging. But we lucked out. We found this amazing company, Nexus Ventures, that was brand new, um, was just sort of getting set up in the middle of the downturn. They were a VC out of India, of all places, but they had just opened a Silicon Valley office, had uh, this incredible guy, Narain Gupta, who was on the board of Red Hat, Mm. knew infrastructure cold and was like, yeah, this, I like this. So we sort of scored this unexpected investment. And once we, you know, we're able to raise our, I think we raised 6 million maybe back in 2008, you know, we could get going. And that was, it's always the hardest part for anybody with that first time, that first round getting a chance, then you can go do something with it. And we were able to to do really well there. I mean, we, we grew really fast. We were able to, we kind of lucked out. We focused on the telcos. That was sort of our key thing was all the telcos had big MSP businesses and they were all kind of terrified of being disrupted by Amazon. So we were able to kind of sell in early before there was even an enterprise private cloud business, we could sell to Korea Telecom and British Telecom mm. and um, GoDaddy was an early customer. In fact, that's where I met our other co-founder, Darren Shepard. He was the chief architect at GoDaddy in the sort of GoDaddy heydays uh, when they were had buying Super Bowl hats and all this stuff. He was the architect there that was working on the cloud and it was classic. He, he would just keep you know, coming back and telling us how shitty our product was. And so, yeah, <laughs> your product's horrible. This is, this thing is just garbage. <laughs> I was like, my first introduction to Darren was as a customer. Like, I'm like, well, look, and he'd be like, I think it needs to be like this. I think we're just going to write our own. Honestly, I don't even think we could possibly use yours. <laughs> you know, and I just fell in love with him. He's one of the best people I know. And uh, he, he, was, he was so good at breaking our product and telling us how to fix it and, and then just fixing it himself. Once we were open source, he was just, plugging holes at left, right, and center. And yeah, I mean, it was just kind of the, the journey just got rolling from there. But yeah, raising the second time, you know, night and day, right? I mean, you, once you've had a, you know, even a, mo- I mean, we first company sold for a couple hundred million dollars. So it was a very good outcome for the VCs, but it was still kind of just getting going kind of when we got acquired. So it was a lot easier to raise the second time. We, we were able to raise, you know, money before we even really started the company. So you could, you had a little bit, of, but that actually kind of was, in some ways, you're not quite as baked. Sure. You know, we knew we wanted to work on containers. We knew we wanted to work around Docker, but we weren't really sure. Again, you had this ecosystem that was just all over the place. You had Docker going in one direction, Mesos going in another, Google building on Kubernetes, but it was brand new. I mean, I think it was sort of announced a couple months after we started Rancher. You had companies like CoreOS and you had Weave and I mean, just lots of little companies building pieces. And we, we were kind of debating between two or three different components, working on networking, working on storage. And eventually we ended up, you know, not being able to sell anything other than a platform. It was like, you know, when we were looking at like, God, that won't sell. And that was like, we're trying to sell Mm -hmm. tires to a car that didn't exist. You know, it was like no (laughs) one needed storage for Kubernetes before they even needed Kubernetes. Yeah. And nobody needed Kubernetes before they needed Docker. It was like, we were at the Docker phase and we were thinking we were going to build tires. And so the good thing about having worked together is this brutal honesty develops really fast. And so, before we knew it, we almost had like, just to show the value of containers, we had to build Rancher, Rancher 1.0, like the first version of 1.0. And interestingly enough, like what we figured out in that first version tended to be some of the key things that would make us successful later on. We figured out that, you know, some of the stuff you and I talk about, right? Multi-tenancy, access control, policy management, sort of like one of the key ideas was that, you know, at the time the big thinking was, you know, if you remember, Mesosphere was talking about the data center operating system, that you would have this big Borg-like Kubernetes clusters that would be the core of your systems. And you would just you know, ev- run everything in this cluster, be super optimized, very efficient. And for whatever reason, that never really struck true with us based on the conversations we were having with customers. We were seeing a much more fragmented reality. And so our thinking was, no, 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 you're going to have containers running in Amazon, you're going to have them running in Google, you're going to have them running on vSphere, you're going to have them running maybe out at the edge, you're going to have them everywhere. And so 
we started with the idea of building multiple clusters, but then centralizing management to manage multiple clusters. And at the time, we didn't wasn't even Kubernetes clusters. Our first implementation of orchestration was a, a project called Cattle that we built ourselves. You know, we tried to use Swarm. We could never get Swarm stable. So Swarm was kind of out there. Kubernetes existed, you know, about like I said, a couple months into the company. So we played with Kubernetes, but it was really complex. And we, we I remember Darren saying, I don't know if this thing is going to take off. It is Greek, man. It is very, you know, there's a lot going on in here, but it's also, it has this feeling of something that by comparison, Docker is so easy to understand. Anybody can wrap their mind around it. So we were playing around trying to figure out what would work. And we ended up building, starting with Swarm and, and not having it work. So we just, Darren just one like month built his own orchestrator called Cattle. And Cattle actually worked really good. It was just like just enough orchestration. It used Compose Mm -hmm. as the framework for defining applications. And we put it out there as this open source project of Rancher 1.0. And it it wasn't like a smash hit by any stretch, but it was a good solid hit. People just liked it. It it was, it allowed them to spin up different clusters in different places. The, you know, they liked the Compose version. They, they liked that the orchestration was very stable. In a lot of ways, the orchestration architecture-wise was a lot more like Kubernetes, but the interface was more like Docker. So it was this weird hybrid of, you know, kind of how you like using Docker's interface, whereas uh, you get into Kubernetes and it's got all this, you know, robustness of HA and really good service integration and things like that. So it ended up being really for the time, a pretty good solution. Um, We were though, we were pretty convinced we weren't going to be able to First of all, we weren't convinced it was better than Kubernetes, and it was certainly not as robust, and it certainly didn't have the engineering resources behind it. And we weren't convinced that even if it was, a company like Rancher was going to be able to you know, set the standard when Red Hat and Google and soon Amazon and Microsoft were all jumping on board. So we, we pivoted pretty early off of that cattle thing. Um, though, though there are people out there who still use it. I get calls all the time. Hey, can you support our old 1.6 environment? We, we love cattle from surprisingly big companies running it. But for the most part, by 2016, we had kind of gone all in on Kubernetes and we were just replaced the orchestrator. But that same concept of centralized management, multi-tenancy, multi-cluster management, policy management, security. And then from there, it kind of just grew the application catalogs, the UI, all the monitoring and logging and sort of more and more of the CNCF ecosystem started to pour in. And and it was funny because we were never really a leader. We were always, you know, we were behind Docker, behind Mesosphere. Red Hat was this enterprise Kubernetes leader. But but our product was really good. It was open source. People loved it once they got their hands on it. And we just saw like the steady, slow growth. It was like a thousand new deployments every month and a thousand the next month and a thousand. And then, you know, we started to close a lot of business pretty consistently as people implemented it. And just liked the product. It was like, yeah, this is a great, and we had a very open model from the beginning. We're like, we're, we're going to go full open source. We're going to try to get this thing out there. We know we're not going to have the reach of Red Hat from an enterprise sales perspective. We're not going to have Google's reach to sell a vision of transforming your company. So we're going to go bottoms up. We're going to connect to the developers. We're going to connect the, the DevOps teams. We're just going to put Rancher in their hands. And if they like it, great. The other thing we've realized pretty early that I think was quite different from others is we realized that our distro of Kubernetes wasn't any better than your distro of Kubernetes. Mm. Like a distro of Kubernetes, just a distro of Kubernetes. It wasn't like we knew Kubernetes better or had a better Kubernetes. We had a Kubernetes distro, but we really in the cloud from like 2017, as soon as there was GKE, like a good Kubernetes hosted service, we were integrating with those really aggressively and pushing people to use the cloud-based Kubernetes when they were in the cloud. And so that kind of strengthened our story because at the time, you know, VMware wasn't even the market. Red Hat was still pitching OpenShift everywhere and it was still single tenant. It was like, you know, it was more Borg-like than multi-cluster management-like. And so we were really kind of the only game in town if you wanted to do hybrid, you wanted to do multiple data centers, you wanted to centralize your policy and you didn't want sprawling clusters. And so, you know, pretty quickly we just started knocking off really big accounts, right? Big banks, big insurance companies, um, companies in the entertainment industry, the government. And they all started pretty small. We didn't, we kind of got one thing right was that we we had a pretty high base to enter because we were open source. We didn't want to sell it real cheap. We wanted to sell it for, you know, we needed people to really spend 50, 60, 70K to get started because we couldn't really support them for less than that. 
But we also weren't charging half a million dollars, a million dollars, $2 million to get started. We have a, from an enterprise perspective, we had a pretty inexpensive starting point. But from an SME perspective, we had a pretty high starting point, which which kind of got us in the right mode. We were adding 40, 50 customers a quarter, as opposed to adding hundreds of small ones that we probably couldn't have supported or only adding three or four, but they were spending 2 million each where we would have been pretty dependent on, you know, very long sales cycles. We had a lot more rapid selling model. More velocity, yeah. Yeah, and that got into a lot of growth, right? So expansion became a big part of what we did. So it was, mm. it, was it all started to roll, you know, by 2018. And we started to feel like, okay, now we've, we've really on to something. Yeah, so let's rewind a little bit because I think even the beginning of the sort of the cloud.com stuff is really interesting. And I think it's interesting, there's a through line here around open source. And so what was the relationship between, you know, kind of cloud.com and CloudStack and then OpenStack? Like, how did that come about? Yeah. So what happened there, you know, 2007, eight, right? You got Amazon starting to emerge and these other cloud providers, there's the sun cloud at the time. There's, you know, there's a handful of people that are doing like early <laughs> infrastructure as a service clouds. And, uh, and there was one other company that wanted to build a software cloud, wanted to do what we were doing. It's a company called Eucalyptus software. Sure. So there was Eucalyptus and cloud stack were the two Martin Mykonos, right? Was yeah, exactly. Was... Exactly. Um, great guy. And they were building, they were a bunch of, professors from down in Santa Barbara who were building a, um, they built sort of a first version of their product a little before we did. And then we built CloudStack, you know, shortly thereafter. Both products were open source. Uh, open Eucalyptus was fully open source. CloudStack was like, you know, we open sourced everything but our adapter to vSphere or something like that. We had a few things that we didn't, mm. but we did have more of what I would call an open core model. Like we were, we were open source, but we hadn't gone all the way. But we were getting good traction. Like I think what we got right that they got wrong in the eucalyptus side was they really focused on the enterprise to begin with. It was funny. Like this market was was getting you know reasonable amounts of investment. Everyone was sort of watching it, and people knew it was going to be a big deal. That there was this infrastructure as a service software seemed like it threatened vSphere. So VMware was going to have a product. There was a lot of talk about vCloud and vSphere getting in. And before OpenStack comes around, there's a couple like big deals that everyone's paying attention to. The funniest one was. Um, Zynga, the like Farmville, the gaming company, yeah, they were like yeah. one of Amazon's first really big customers. Like they were at one point, I think they're like a third of AWS was running Farmville games on Facebook. <laughs> and they're like, you know, we're spending a fortune. We've got to get out of Amazon. We've got to move this into our own data centers. We're going to be this huge gaming company. So we're, so they run this big bake off between us and Eucalyptus. It was probably the first really good private cloud deal to go build a, you know, multi million dollar, huge infrastructure investment private cloud. And we end up winning this deal, you know, and really a lot of the technical improvements we made there were, were kind of core because, you know, dealing with them, the networking in these private cloud things is just so complex and you really have to put a lot of investment into that. And, and, you know, we were coming into that Zynga deal with, you know, kind of neck and neck with Eucal. They were sort of the early favorite. They seemed to be in the position Mm. most likely to win the deal, but we kind of came from behind to end up winning it. And, And winning it was, was really based on just really, really working with their architects to build a networking model that would work for the cloud. But it ended up being super valuable later on as the market scaled. You know, we had these big cloud providers that were the telcos, but they were all trying to compete with Amazon, right? They were Their goal was to build their own infrastructure as a service cloud and offer utility-based computing. This was like the first company who wasn't trying to compete. They were just building a giant cloud. For their own internal use. And then there yeah. were more and more and more afterwards that. But we got rolling with that Zynga win. All of a sudden, we had a great reference. They were talking publicly everywhere. And then the deal started coming in. And probably not that long after that, it was probably... 2010, but I could be getting the dates wrong. We probably closed that deal in 2010. And right around then, Rackspace, Citrix, and Dell ended up being the, the founders of OpenStack. But Rackspace kind of reached out to us and said, hey, we, what do you think about open sourcing all of CloudStack? You know? And we were like, yeah, we, we could probably consider doing that. And I think they were talking to the team at Eucalyptus a little bit too. But they ended up deciding at the last minute. Oh, NASA was involved. It was NASA was the other right, company that was yeah. involved. But they decided at the end that they didn't want to do that. They wanted to start from scratch, that they didn't like something about our architecture. But we were also not fully, like we were kind of semi-committal, right? We were kind of rolling and and we still were doing pretty well with this, especially with the enterprise, we were doing kind of well with this open core model. And so in a lot of ways, we weren't fully committed to going all open source and they weren't fully committed to not building their own thing. And so they say, hey, no, we're going to do OpenStack, but we'd like you guys to be part of it. And we're like, 
well, why would we be part of building something that we've already built? And, but to his credit, Shang was like, yeah, let's just be part of it. It can't be bad to be part of it. So let's just be part of it. Maybe we'll, if it turns out to be better than what we have, we'll throw away what we have and use this new open standard. And if it turns out to be worse, then we'll compete with it. Or, and so we, if you ever go back, like in the open, like we're in there as a founding member of OpenStack and we're going, you know, I spent all this time at these OpenStack conferences and they were, but they were all trying to beat us. Like at some level, they would you Google CloudStack versus OpenStack. There's all these CloudStack versus OpenStack articles back in 2010, 2011, 2012, as people, you know, were baking off one versus the other. And at the time, we were like, well, we can't be not open when they're open. So we ended up making CloudStack an Apache project and going fully in on open source. Mm. But even then, it was just all the momentum in the market was really with OpenStack. I mean, before you knew it, you had Red Hat and you know, Sousa and Ubuntu, everybody was sort of jumping on, yeah, let's get onto this bandwagon. You know, the downside is that never really went anywhere. That OpenStack project ended up suffering from, you know, not being great, well architected, not being all that stable. And also over time, you know, being way more than most people needed to manage infrastructure for their environment. So it didn't, it never really turned out to be a big space. But the lesson I took away from the whole thing was, you know, even if CloudStack was a better piece of software, it's kind of irrelevant if the market is going with an open source alternative that's very well supported by lots of companies that nobody wants to bet wrong on enter- enterprise infrastructure. You don't want to be, you know, out on some island as the only people running, you know, something. And you see it today, right? I mean, you know, I think Mesos ended up in that same point. HashiCorp's Nomad ended up in that same point where it could have been better, could have been not better. It almost didn't matter. People just wanted a standard. They wanted a standard. Kubernetes was a standard. And that ended up causing people to choose and pick, you know, more often than not based on, you know, not wanting to be on the wrong side of the technology gap. And I think that's probably a good thing for these open source projects to see consolidation because it allows the whole ecosystem then to bloom around it once you have a, a standard piece. But it definitely influenced a lot of my thinking at Rancher when we, you know, went all in on open and, and, you know, we've never written a line of proprietary code since we started the company. We just were like, yeah, let's put our product out there into that open source ecosystem and see if it's good enough to get adopted. And if it is, maybe we get things that start to take off. And, and interestingly enough, while, while Rancher took off and became really popular as a management layer, the one that really took off for us later was K3S, this really lightweight, dumb, simple right. Kubernetes distro that could run, you know, on a single node at the edge just exploded and you know now is driving a ton of business that's focused on just uh, these new types of embedded systems and you know shipping kubernetes with your device shipping kubernetes with your atm machine or you know your medical device or you know embedding it in nuclear power plants or now even shipping software right just like i just have software i'm just going to embed k3s ship the whole thing out to my customers and that's probably the biggest the first time we've ever had like what i would think of as a really huge hit on the open source side. I mean, Rancher has been really successful, but K3S, you know, 10 times as many people using it, even as Rancher. So it's interesting. The open source world is a great way to get to users and get to developers. It's very hard to monetize. It creates, you know, an enormous amount of challenge when you're raising money and you're trying to build a business model. But, you know, we found that Kubernetes especially was in a really nice place where the criticality of it really f- drove people to want to pay for support. And, and that's probably the one thing that people get the most confused on is how do you build a business model around open source? Yeah, I mean, how, well, so talk about what what you were offering. Like, you know, when you say support, like, what did that entail? Like, what were people paying for? Well, you know, from the beginning, you know, there's a bunch of open source models that people have been successful with. They tend to range from the simplest, which is, hey, here's our open source software. We'll give you a distribution of it that we support. And, you know, that's kind of the Red Hat model, the SUSE model, the people, you know, the Linux model sort of proved that out. And we'll patch it. We'll give you, you know, the same kind of support you get from EMC, from VMware, from anyone else. You know, that's the model we ended up going. Then there's a lot of open core models where people tack on a lot of closed proprietary software on top. And it's like, hey, if you pay, not only do you get support for the open source bits, but by the way, we'll give you a whole bunch of other tools around security or multi-tenancy, almost like the SaaS model where you add in more function for your paying customer. There's an open source version of that. Mm -hmm. Tends to have the distinct problem that once you pay for those things, if you ever stop paying, you kind of have to rip the whole thing out and start over. So it's unfortunately, it kind of breaks the whole point in some cases of of open source, which is a bit more leverage and less lock-in. And then there's the SaaS model of open source where, hey, you know, here's the open source version, but we have a really good hosted version. You don't really want to run this, do you? We'll, we'll run it for you. We ended up in that first category. We, we provided 
you know, uh, of just support for ranchers. So the customers, you know, they'd put it into production and they, if it was critical for them, they would put it in support contract in place with us. So we would provide, you know, that enterprise grade support. But one of the interesting things about it is you learn pretty quickly, you better be really good at support (laughs) because, you know, your only value is how good you are at making sure the customer is getting great support, getting their questions answered, root cause down, you know, you have to draw a pretty wide circle around what does it mean to support a product? So, you know, getting into supporting the product, but also its dependencies. You know, these days, if someone's buying support from Rancher, it's we're supporting the Rancher product, we're supporting our distro of Kubernetes, we're supporting our integration to all the public cloud Kubernetes, we're supporting Docker or Container D, the daemon, you know, below that, the networking layer that's inside of Kubernetes, we're supporting Prometheus and Istio and OPA. And I mean, you get it, it starts to become, you're not really supporting just one thing, you're providing this ecosystem of support. But for the customer, that's what they need, right? They need someone who they can call if something's not working in the platform. And so that's allowed us to kind of increase value over time by providing support for more and more of the ecosystem, you know, what we think of as the CNCF ecosystem. And that, you know, it's not easy. It's not as sticky. Churn can be a little bit higher because there's nothing preventing a customer from leaving, right? They just, you know, say the project's not quite as important to them. Maybe it's no longer in production, but they're still running it. They'll just turn off support even while they're still running the system. And very often, you know, 98% of the users of Rancher use it without paying us anything, right? They just use the open source and they love it. They manage, you know, all their EKS clusters, for example, on top of, you know, using Rancher you know, they don't need support from us. So, you know, we've been able to really find these interesting use cases and these places where the market does need us to provide a lot of value, but it's kind of a continuous battle to keep pushing more value into the platform, providing infrastructure in more places, and also making sure that support is just fantastic. Because like, if we're not getting an eight or nine, uh, you know, on an NPS score, you know, we risk having churn that we don't want to see, right? That it makes it too hard to build the business. So we were really good at that. We had a fantastic customer success management team that really enabled us to meet all of our customers' expectations and ensure we didn't get into the problem of paying for support and then not being happy with what you paid for. But it was it took some learning to get there for sure. Yeah. So this is really interesting. How did you price that support package? Was it like an ELA or was it based on some amount of usage? Yeah, I mean, we this was a really good learning for us as well. When we, when we first started, we weren't sure at all how to price it. So we priced it based on like vCPUs or CPUs under management, mm-hmm. something like that. And um, later we just sort of simplified it a little bit. But, you know, at the time we were kind of competing at some level with Docker themselves. And they, they had approached it in a very simple way. It was like per node pricing. So the number of hosts you had running Docker, you paid them, say, two or three thousand dollars per host list price and that was it so you could buy two hosts or three hosts or four hosts and get started in fact they rapidly got to six seven eight hundred customers but a lot of them were spending less than 20 grand less than 10 grand and i was really worried about that business model because there were a lot of people who wanted to do the same with us they're like hey just let me pay for the three nodes or the five, my first starting environment but we you know, I kind of knew support quality was going to be really important. And, and I knew we weren't all that good at doing support early days. So so we decided not to do it that way. We decided to sell our product based on a per node price, but with a minimum of 20 nodes and then a management server cost too. So we sort of charged for the a platform level fee for the rancher management server, which allowed us to get the price closer to, you know, 50, 60 grand to start with for a customer. And you know, there were people who were really upset about that. I'd have people say like, you know, I'm just using three nodes or five nodes. I've got a little cluster. Can't I just pay 10 grand? Or f-? And we would say, look, you know, you're welcome to use the software. It's hundred percent free, but for support, I can't make any money charging you only 10 grand. And I can't give you the kind of support you need. If you're telling me this is production, this is mission critical. I've got to have people up, you know, 24 by seven working with you around the world. So, I'm sorry, no, I can't do that. That really helped, like being really transparent and walking away from deals, being very comfortable to walk away from deals. That was critical for us. So, you know, it probably kept us from having as many customers, but the customers we had, they really had to sell it internally. They had to go get someone to sign off on spending 50 grand. And so the churn was less. There was, you know, a real commitment to doing it. And it ended up being perfect. It was just sort of the right sweet spot where we were 
We were able to add customers. It wasn't too high to be prohibitive. It also wasn't too cheap that we weren't making enough money to hit all of our business goals. And so we were able to beat our number quarter after quarter after quarter after quarter. It was just in this model of, of seeding the market with open source and then seeing it come up, get to production, at least in those big enterprises that had money to spend. And then, you know, somebody saying, look, we can't come to production with this platform without support. Let's make sure we're connected and working with the guys over at Rancher. That was sort of the magic of our model. And it worked really well. It was just consistently, we, you know, 70% of our business was inbound, right? It was them calling us saying, hey, we found your product. We love it. We'd like to talk to your salespeople. We'd like to talk, you know. And that was the other thing. We, our marketing team just knocked it out of the park. You know, we didn't focus on marketing on who needs enterprise Kubernetes support. Our focus was all on, you know, building with Kubernetes, like helping you understand how to build with Kubernetes. So we ran, I mean, just an almost insane number of virtual events, right? We were, every month we were doing an online meetup. Every week we were doing a master class. Every every Thursday at 10, we had come hang out with one of our field engineers and just learn the product, learn how to install it, learn how to use it. We had, you know, we were at every KubeCon, DockerCon. We were at, you know, every DevOps days and cloud days. I mean, we really... We really invested in being present and having a huge community with, you know, we never put a lot of pressure to buy, you know, it was always just use, just use, just use. And so, you know, our Slack channel had thousands and 10,000 people on it chatting with each other. Our forums were super busy. You know, Darren and I would host meetups that would go for hours. Like we would talk for two hours, three hours, uh, showing people how to do monitoring for containers. And in fact, at one point we had an article that was, you know, comparing five methods of monitoring. That was the number one article you would find if you just typed in container monitoring, right? Like we would be writing just enormous amounts of content. So, So we, we made up for our sort of lack of name brand awareness, right? We weren't Docker, we weren't Red Hat, we weren't Google, like we weren't, Nobody knew who we were, so we made up for it with this really aggressive content marketing program and just putting so much of the information you needed to get started out into people's hands. You know, we had we did online training that was 100% free, this incredible university of classes, you know, you could get certified and never pay a penny, just go through, you know, our little mini Udacity. But in every single piece, we captured names, we captured leads. So we built this really strong database. I mean, we knew everybody who was doing anything with containers because at one level or another, they were ending up on our website or they were meeting us at a conference or they were coming to our mm-hmm. thing. And that then turned quite well as we started to scale into connecting that to an SDR team and beginning to really build a sales motion that allowed us to, you know, make sure people didn't fail. Because one of the things we'd find with open source was, you know, there was relatively high risk that you would download it, you would try it and you'd get something wrong or you wouldn't quite understand how to use it. And, and all of a sudden you'd fail. So then a lot of our work really came into, you know, filtering out the 4,000, 5,000 leads we'd be getting a month down to the, you know, 500, the 10% that were at larger organizations trying to do something that probably had a little more meat. Maybe we're comparing us to OpenShift where we could then drop in, you know, excellent field engineers and show them, oh, oh yeah, sorry, our product's a little bit non-intuitive. Let's fix that. Let, let's show you the parts that, for whatever reason, that weren't coming through. And then we'd learn from that and try to go fix the product to make it more intuitive so that people who downloaded it, you know, could understand what we were trying to do and, and fix gaps. So we were just rapidly iterating. We were doing a release every you know, four releases a year, three releases a year, you know, in the early days, trying to get new features out, new, more usability, more product capability, because, you know, it was just very, even now, just very competitive spot, right? You had the biggest companies in the world, you know, Docker was a household name at the time in IT, you had Red Hat, you know, you had later VMware kind of got involved in the market, you had Google pitching their story around Anthos. So you had these huge companies we were competing with, we just had to we had to be differentiated and being open source was great because almost none of them were really a, a good open source option, right? Even though Red Hat's OpenShift is open, it's not the kind of thing people just download and use the open version of. So where we're 98% of our users are open source for them, it's like 5% of the users are open source, right? Most people are just buying it and kind of taking it as part of their rel subscription. So it was great. We had this real community of people that just fell in love with the product. That's super interesting. And so I mean, there's a bunch of pieces in here. So, I mean, I think the focus on sort of that top of funnel, right, and bring in, it's really like create a bunch of value for your audience, right? Like content and training and everything else you can and get people excited about your ecosystem and then getting them in. And eventually they move around to big companies and 
those companies start using your things and your things need support um, in order to, to make sure that they can really scale it out and use it across the org. And I'm guessing as well, like you mentioned this kind of base platform fee um, that ended up, you know, with like a 50K ASP average selling price. But there's also this per node pricing or per VCPUs. I don't know which one you ended up using long term. No, but I'm yeah. guessing that allowed some of your customers, yeah, so per node to really scale well beyond the the 50K. And so you probably have, you know, multi-million dollar contracts at some point. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, you, you nailed it, Grant. So, you know, we used almost like a high-low strategy. We tried to have a, a kind of a high management fee, but a relatively low node fee. So we were mm-hmm. price competitive. When a person looked at us and they said, well, you know, Red Hat's charging me 2500 per CPU pair, right? So it's 5000 for a host. We were like, well, we're only 1000 for a host, right? So you, you, this is a much more reasonable. And now, of course, Red Hat's discounts bring that way down. So it's not like we're really that far out. But we we came up with a model that was strike a fair price for the management server and then make sure the node price is, you know, is fair. It's kind of in the right ballpark where a company would say, yeah, that lines with the value. Don't discount. We really were harsh about discounting because we were like, mm. we're not the Kate jewelers or whatever, right? Like we're, we're not putting on a 70% markup on this thing. We're, you know, you can tell our price is very fair compared to our competitors. So we were normally only discounting sort of maybe 10%, 15%, 20% if a person started to scale. And then, you know, yeah, eventually that you have companies starting to push for ELAs, but we really never pushed for them ourselves. We always were like, no, let's just, just go by nodes, go by nodes. And it was always great because when they came back and said, no, we don't really want to go by nodes anymore. You knew you were kind of starting to get to the point where the value was starting to creep up. They started to see the impact of containers and Kubernetes, the product. And, you know, again, we, we always were pretty easy to work with. We'd sort of work with them to understand what they needed and and then take it down and do the deals and make sure they were satisfied. So we we started to see that, you know, really 2017, 2018, 2019, you know, lots and lots more now, even now, you know, to these days, it's, but it really has never stopped. I would say the interesting thing is, despite that and all that growth happening, the quarter after quarter, we keep seeing more and more net new, right? So the net new customers, you know, was 20, then 30, then 40, then a quarter, then 50 a quarter, then 60 a quarter. The growth in Kubernetes was also rising the number of net new. So the ecosystem now we're, you know, over 500 customers that are running the enterprise platform and adding them really fast. And that was one of the things that was really appealing about Suzo was just the reach, right? I mean, the one area where we were, you know, despite all of this, we were still pretty handicapped as we were a, at that point, we were a 240 person company scaling well, but you know, at some level, like, you know, IBM you know, putting ads in the Super Bowl about hybrid cloud computing with Red Hat, right? You have VMware's <laughs> entire mission to be selling Tanzu. You have Google, you know, beating the drum at the CIO level about Anthos. We were definitely still in, I would say, a pretty disadvantaged position, pretty significantly disadvantaged because we just didn't know install base, right? We don't have an install base to really rely on. And while we were working really well with the the cloud providers, because we did such a good job of managing their Kubernetes, mm. It was still, you know, we just didn't have that pull in the market that they all had. And so, you know, we had a great product. We had, you know, this nice inbound, just really strong meshes. But what, what Suso was able to really bring to us and they really sold us on was, you know, having 6,000 customers, right? Being able to, you know, they had the Linux base and 30% of the world's Linux, right? They had this huge, huge market in Europe where they were just dominant. And they also had the benefit of having just been spun out. They were PE owned, so they had a very clear desire to grow. This you mm. know, obsession about growing a business and driving the growth. They had a really great new leadership team. So it was really... It was a very unusual. I mean, I don't think any. We certainly didn't go into last year, especially in the middle of COVID, thinking we were going to sell the company. I think I would have bet almost anything that wasn't going to happen. And we were, you know, hitting all our numbers. Things were going really well, but they just had almost the perfect need for what we did, and and they were kind of at the perfect scale and size to make it a really good fit, where they they could really help us accelerate. Plus, they had the potential of, you know, a, a future exit of their own that you could sort of see a big one plus one equals three opportunity working with them. So it was a tough decision. I mean, it's always a really tough decision to sell your company, but I, I think it was the right one. I'm, I've been super happy since we joined Suza. It's been everything they promised, just this amazing customer base that loves them to death and you know gives us a much better product portfolio and, and much more interest now in talking about the whole infrastructure stack because now we can talk about you know Linux plus the container strategy plus you know kind of everything from 
bare metal all the way up to the Kubernetes ecosystem. And that's, that's interesting when you get into, you know, we had tried for a while, we had Rancher OS, we had K3OS, we've been trying for a while to see if we could build, you know, a really kind of integrated stack. And now all of a sudden we got the world's second biggest Linux engineering organization. And we're just doing really, really cool things now that start to look at, even if there should be any um, line between containers and Linux and Kubernetes and such, maybe it's all really just one thing, right? It's just basically the new OS, right? The new OS starts at the kernel and, you know, runs containers and self-orchestrates. So it's been a really interesting and good fit. No, that's great. And I, and I definitely want to, you know, kind of dive into some of the integration acquisition stuff in a bit, but, you know, back to this, your business model, right? And this idea of you only sell supports. There's no proprietary bits you're selling at all. It's only support. But you mentioned as part of that customer success, right? You know, and, and I have kind of a thesis here around, and you kind of mentioned it too, that that support is a broader circle than I think many people think it is. But I kind of have, I've been writing this kind of, I don't know, blog post or something about supported versus unsupported software and the idea that there's different types of functional activities that support does. And one of those things I think is, is customer success because you know, ultimately the responsibility of ensuring expansion, if it's unsupported, it falls upon the team, you know, like the enterprise to make sure that more people are going to use this standard and going to follow these best practices and are going to like adopt this. And if someone leaves that was championing it, like then somebody else has to take up the torch and fall through on all this, right? But when you work with a vendor, you are very incented to help them grow their usage of it and standardize on this, you know? And so you end up as part of your support, like sort of ensuring that this is adopted broadly throughout the company and then that there's continuity if someone does leave or there's consistency between teams. And so I really think that support is so much more than what people sort of initially think about it as. Does that all make sense to you? Yeah, no, it's spot on. I think, you know, by the time you're running a real enterprise software company, you better be doing more than, you know, break fix. You better be doing more than drawing a very tight boundary around your product's bugs and fixing those bugs because that's not what anyone signs up for. And that's not what they pay for. That's not what they renew. So it's funny. My, my feeling on support has always been that the best support organizations are really close to engineering, you know, to drive product quality and things like that. At Rancher, we put this guy named Bala Gopalan who ran our support organization. In fact, our support organization wasn't that good in the early days. And Bala was running our services team and we, we moved Bala over to take on support. And he, he moved it into the engineering organization. So we kind of reported directly to one of our founders, Will Chan, who ran engineering. And by moving it into that team, it just kind of changed the perspective of the people in there, got everyone focused really on, you know, time to address problems instead of time to respond. Mm -hmm. So like really started working on, you know, how quickly can we understand the problem, engage, get a solution and help the customer with what they're dealing with. And that was really, really important, but it didn't get us all the way because we, we still needed to build customer success. And we built customer success as part of the sales organization. So it was part of my team, but we addressed it in a really interesting way because we weren't really sure what the profile of our customer success person should be. Should we be hiring someone who was kind of a, a technical person, more like a field engineer or a sales engineer as customer success because they could get into the weeds a little bit more with the customer? Should we be treating it more like a renewal rep who, who kind of knew and, and sold? And one of my oldest friends, a guy named Dave Getzler, who, um, who had run our America sales, I asked him to take on this customer success program. And, and in taking it on, he really figured out something I thought was really genius. We, we actually started promoting our SDRs into it. So we had these SDRs that were sometimes a year, two years in, knew the product really well, knew the company, were eager to start working with customers, but they were still maybe not quite ready to be an outside salesperson. And so we started putting them in as customer success reps. And the best of them did fantastic in that role. But what they, what they really learned there was how to understand, I mean, they were all reasonably technically savvy, having been with us for two years or a year and a half or something, they knew the product, they understood, you know, they weren't mispronouncing Kubernetes. Um, but more importantly, they they had figured out 
like qualification, like why people bought, right? Like what was the reason, like what would cause a person to take a meeting, right? Like mm. when they talk to someone, like why would they be a good potential customer? And they've listened to so many first calls and second calls with customers that they kind of understood the needs customers had. And so when they would sit down as a customer success person, they wouldn't focus on, well, how's the implementation or how's the architecture? They would actually focus on, you know, what were you guys trying to achieve? What was the business goal you were facing with this thing? And who was the economic buyer? Like who paid for this? In fact, what Dave really trained them to do, which was, I thought, brilliant, was to, to get incredibly close to the economic buyer. Because the easy thing is to get close to the technical owner of the system, right? You have this technical owner of the system who is probably a fan, likes ranch, or wants to talk to us all the time. He's easy to talk to, you know. But then there's the economic owner who cares about whatever the output of this platform was. And often is, he's got people that he's reporting to or sort of dotted line into that is re- are relying on his system in this case, on his platform in this case, maybe developers, maybe application owners, whatever. And so by making sure we had both of those relationships, obviously we were working with the technical people pretty hands in hand. They were the ones filing the tickets. They got to know our customer support team pretty well. Our customer support team was doing a really good job getting to know them. And, and the CSMs would understand their problems and sort of document them and track, you know, features they were looking for and the like, but they always connected to the economic part. And because we had this very clear, most of our customers are on one year contracts, like one year mm. support contracts. So, you know, one of the first questions they'd be like, is like, okay, a year from now, what do I need to make sure I've done to earn your business? You know, we just ask that guy very <laughs> bluntly, because I'm going to need you to renew next year and you don't have to, it's an open source product. You can just stop paying me. And so the person would just lay it out. Look, I need you to do these things. And we figured out pretty quickly that, that one of the most important things we needed to do was when there was actually a problem. When one of their engineers filed a SEV-1, we needed to make sure that economic buyer knew about it. Because often, the engineer wasn't telling the economic owner that there was an issue and that they were on it. And sometimes that would create a lot of chaos internally. And so what we found was if we, every time a SEV-1, we actually built into Zendesk and, and Slack and everything, these alerts that would actually alert a CSM, hey, there's been a SEV-1 at one of your clients. This is what they're trying to deal with. Let you click here, read the ticket. And then they would then proactively be reaching out to the economic buyer and telling that economic buyer, hey, just so you know, we've got an issue with one of your systems. This is what it looks like. Our person's on it. I'm here if you have any questions, if you need, if you know, we're treating this with the highest level of priority. But that outbound at the time of this, sometimes telling them about it, that, hey, John and your team has already let us know about this. We're working on it. I just want to make sure you know we're on top of it. If there's, we're treating this the highest level of severity, we'll be back to you with a root cause analysis as soon as we figure out what happened and why it happened. Like that made just this massive difference because in those moments where they were stressed out, they were getting a reach out from us telling them, don't worry, we're on this. And then they could then tell that to someone else. They're like, yes, but we're on it. We understand what's going on. We think we've got a solution. And we would update them during that SEV1 period. It was just like over-communicate. Make sure there was no gap in the communication. But it's just things like that. It doesn't seem like a lot, but it it comes from that person being comped on renewal. You know, the <laughs> renewal and the expansion, yeah. right? Like he's only paid if it, so it's that sales mentality of you've got to get the renewal and you're, bonus is really tied to the expansion, right? Like your salary and your OTE is tied to the renewal and upside is all tied to the expansion. You really want to drive this thing. And younger SDR centric people were perfect for this. They were, they were hungry. They could be coached. And, um, though a couple changes like that, we saw about a 30% reduction in churn, just getting more aggressive on this. So significant, dropping a lot of it came from making sure at the end of the year we knew who had had issues who hadn't had issues somebody who'd been running really smoothly we were really proactive with to make sure you know because that would be a challenge too if you're selling support and someone doesn't need it like the product was so good i don't file any tickets that you know you want to be a little bit careful about those because they tend to be a little less likely to renew than somebody who's you know in that sweet spot where they've had a couple issues and they see at least the value in having a support system so I think it's just fun. I mean, th- I always found the customer success stuff fun. And Dave, who had never done it, he was always a sales. I mean, he was one of the head of BDs at that first company I worked for back in 1999. Is where I met Dave. But he'd always been in sales and he'd never done CSM, but he was just such a natural because he understood how much impact the economic buyer had on the renewal and how to work closely with them. I love that. That's super interesting and not something that I would have thought of. And it's a great path for that kind of BDR, SDR you know, before they, they go into sort of that like field sales, enterprise sales, they can really work to get renewals. That's beautiful. One thing, you know, as you're saying this, this idea that those customers who don't have issues, right? Like, like what, what was your CSM team doing to help them? Is it 
best practices? Is it, you know, more usage? What, what were they? It was a little more challenging, to be fair. When you had people that weren't having issues, and especially over time, as the product became more and more stable, you know, what we were really working with those people on was roadmap type of things. We'd mm-hmm. make sure we were in doing roadmap briefings, talking about what they needed. Like, how was the platform working for them? Was it great? Was there something that they'd like to see? You know, the more we could get them hooked into our engineering team, the more we could get them excited about the next release, the more we could just make them comfortable that they had picked the right technology, they were working with the right vendor. So we'd build a customer advisory board, we'd have, you know, PMs getting on the phone with them, showing them the roadmaps. We talked a lot about new things we were working on. Hey, we're working on this new open source project, K3S. You know, we'd love your feed on back on it before we drop it. Or Longhorn, we're going to put that into the CNCF. It's this new storage platform for Kubernetes. Let's show you what it's all about. And here comes uh, Harvesters, our new thing. Like we kept building new things and we kept putting them in front of them. And when they blended, it was just perfect. They'd be like, oh, I love what you're doing. I like working with you guys. I feel like I know what's happening in the ecosystem. Mm. We talked, they'd be like, hey, what about Istio versus Linkerd? What about Prometheus versus Datadog? You think I can get there with this? And we wanted to add a lot more value. And we, and we would do that for everybody. But I, <laughs> one of our, our you know little alerts was, hey, somebody hasn't had a ticket in five months, four months. Let's make sure we're doing some proactive outreach because we don't want to we don't want to only be talking to them when it's time to renew. We want to be talking to them before it's time to renew a couple more times. Make sure they, you know, they feel like the hundred grand they're spending with us or two hundred grand they're spending with us is giving them real value, allowing them to worry about other things besides what's happening in Kubernetes land. It's like, hey, you don't have to worry about what's happening in Kubernetes land. We'll worry about that for you. We'll give you an update on the projects. You know, Shang's on the TOC. I'm on the CNCF board. We're mm. we're living this world. Talk to us. We'll tell you what's going on, so you can tell us what's important to you, and and that'll help influence our roadmap. So was that those little things like that were really useful for you know for the customers who maybe they weren't having as many issues or or not. To be fair, we didn't have a lot of people where they would not renew because the product was just so stable. I mean, they, for the most part, they were buying insurance, right? They were buying support for the day when things did go bad, right? Because they were running something really critical, so it wasn't a huge problem, but it was. It was something that we wanted to make sure we were on top of most of the time. Yeah, this idea of like selling insurance is funny. You probably know Alex Polvey a little bit, don't you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So when you know, I had him on the show uh, two years ago, maybe he talked about sort of what Red Hat does is they basically sell insurance, right? Like, but I think there's so much more, and this is kind of that you know it was, it was alluding to before in this like, what is supported software mean? Like this build versus buy, right? I think this is. Even for a product like Rancher, these 98% of customers that aren't paying you, that are using the product, mm-hmm. what I don't think that the like quote unquote buyer really understands is that they are performing a lot of the roles that your team could be doing if they paid you, right? And and like so somebody inside their company, you know, if it's a decent sized company, is doing some amount of customer success or some amount of evangelism, some amount of like, you know, there is somebody is keeping them, you know, up to date on the happenings of the CNCF and sort of filtering through projects and, and bringing things that could be interesting to them. So like there is, there's so much more that you're doing beyond insurance and break fix. And I don't know if buyers really calculate that when they do kind of a build versus buy or like they see the amount of hours that their team you know is going to need to do or if they don't end up doing those things then it's just not successful right like they end up not getting the transformation and digital transformation that they want they end up simply with like a oh yeah like we have all these different projects and people use them and like somebody's on this and somebody's on this and there's different you know there's no like cohesive story and unifying like strategy it's just like kind of ad hoc yeah you know grant the biggest reason people don't buy support i've found over the years is they don't have money like just full stop right like okay. the vast majority of those 98 percent, they're at startups they're at companies in developing markets they're trying to convince their company that this technology is ready for prime time they're they're in budget crunches in their company and they just don't have money to spend on this. They have to prioritize something else. It's like they're paying salaries and they can't afford to also invest in this. So there tends to be, you know, very few companies that I would say actively believe they can do a better job supporting an open source project than the companies who built it. Mm-hmm. But there are tons. I mean, you know, right now at this point, 
China's an even bigger consumer of rancher than the U.S., right? There's more rancher deployments today in China than there are in the U.S. Wow. And while we have a lot of customers in China, a lot of big ones, the vast majority, there is probably 99.9% of the usage is unpaid, sure. right? And whereas here, maybe it's 95% of the usage or 94 or something like that. So it tends to be that there's also lots of workloads that aren't that critical, to be honest with you. There's yeah. a lot of workloads that just aren't that important. I, I, it's an internal workload. It's something we're building, you know, I'm not running, you know, my company's main transacting systems. I'm just running, you know, something that does some HR processes. If it goes down, I'll reboot the system. It's probably going to be fine. So there's this, you know, to me, at least I always find that there's almost always a really good reason. There's a few people that just think they can build anything better. And those, God bless them, let them go and do it because they're the hardest customers to make happy anyways. And, and they're sure. So I, I'll tell you this, like, I don't think our business would be bigger if we were closed source. Oh, no, I no. don't think people would be like just beating us up to buy, you know, I think there's, my gut feel is that the people who, um, you know, who underestimate that cost of open source, they don't last that long in enterprise IT because mm. you get burned once or twice and you don't grow, like your career gets stalled out. And that's the problem in IT. You know, you're, you're the guy who says, yeah, we got this. Don't worry. We're going to build our own Kubernetes platform. We're going to build our own version. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I come in and someone is replacing, you know, the guy who built their own rancher has been fired. And now they've still <laughs> got their own rancher and they've got to like tear it down and replace it with rancher. And it's like, yeah, yeah, that guy, you know, wh why was he fired? Oh, because the system was totally unstable, yeah. right? Because he had four engineers trying to do what we have 150 or 200 doing. And it couldn't keep up with the latest builds of Kubernetes and it couldn't keep up with the changes in OPA and it couldn't keep up with the changes going on in Prometheus and it couldn't keep up with the changes in, in Docker. And I mean, again, you know, yeah, you could build a, a basic provisioner that says, hey, go create, you know, a cluster. But building something that also has multi-tenancy and also has, you know, some of the business logic you need about who's allowed to do what and defining, it's just hard and it, it takes work. So I think I always feel like those you know, you see those in the early days of a market when people don't really know that there's good solutions out there and there's bright people who love to build. I, I love those people. They tend to be, you know, a lot of the time they figure it out themselves too. The smart ones kind of realize, oh, I've been building this thing, but now there's this rancher and it's solely open. Why wouldn't I use that? And we're starting to see that with this embedded market. You know, recently we did a partnership with NetApp where they were, they had been building their own version of rancher kind of to embed and distribute. We just did another deal with a very large hardware company and, and they were kind of going to build their own thing. And it was like, well, if you're open, we have leverage. You're not going to be able to, because that's what people want. Honestly, what is really powerful about open source is it's a fair playing field, right? Like when I sit down to negotiate a, in ELA, right? I may be the world's best person at supporting Rancher, but I'm not the only option to support Rancher. Sure. Right? They have other options. If I tell them, hey, tough, it's going to be $12 million, you know, they'll say, you know what? I think I can probably do this for $12 million, right? I can go find people or maybe I can hire Accenture or I can hire Wipro or somebody else and I can actually support this or I can find another option besides me. So, you know, they're not going to have to go uninstall it. They're not going to have to go tear it out of their system. So I have to meet, I have to meet them in the middle where the value is right and the alternative is fair. You know, that means two things. One, you have to be willing to walk away. You know, I've had CIOs tell me, I don't care. It's open source. I'm not paying you more than 100K. I don't care how much we use. And I've always just said like, well, unfortunately, we couldn't build a business that way. So good luck. You should go and do it yourself. You know, support it yourself. Like, I can't build a business if I said yes to that everywhere. And if everyone agrees with you, then I'll, you know, my business will fail and you'll be right. But that's the, you know, that's the risk I'm taking being an open source business. And, you know, to be fair, in that case, that CIO didn't stay in his job and he was gone two years later and they became a customer and paid normal price just like everyone else. But that it's a pretty healthy dynamic. I mean, I think people have been burned, right? They've been burned by both open source companies that have locked them in. I think Red Hat locks people in in a way that is shocking for as open as they say they are. They're incredibly locked in. They're completely controlled about what they're allowed to do and how they're allowed to use it. And if you stop paying, your cost of getting off the systems is very high. So, We've always tried to be all different than that and say, no, just keep it a very fair thing. There's no license key. You stop paying. You just keep using the software if you like to and uninstall it if you don't. And it forces us to be really good at customer support, like we were talking about, really good at customer success, find fair value, keep adding more crap to our product because if we don't, you know, customers will start pressuring us to reduce the price or not, you know, we're not adding more value year after year. 
I've just found it to be a really, it may not be the most profitable model. Like I certainly VMware's model is a better model. Like they're going to make, you know, billions on their products that are proprietary and stuff, at least for that, a few more years. But in the long run, I just think this model is, is where the market's going. I think open source is real. You know, organizations are contributing to it. People are willing to do almost anything as an open source project. There's plenty of companies that have had success now building businesses around it and companies like us that have done well building the most liberal version of open source business. So I think I think it's going to be harder and harder to have proprietary software companies in the infrastructure space unless you have just incredible breakthrough technology, right? Something that's just so hard to do that, you know, people have to use your bits to get that advantage. I totally agree. The one thing you said, though, that I think is probably not, at least it's not obvious to me, is you have to be willing to walk away. And this is a combination of your minimum price that was a little bit you know, too high for some people, as well as just like, hey, at that amount of usage, your price is going to be X, Y, and Z, and we don't discount that much, and this is how our business works. Because if you don't do that, then people feel like they can negotiate you down to like where there's no business. But by keeping that sort of pressure up, it's like you either can work with us at a fair price or you don't get to work with us at all. And there's not like a let's nickel and dime me down to where it's like it's painful for me to work with you. It's like it's either this is a great relationship for me and you or we don't have a relationship at all. I think that's really critical for open source businesses to do, though. And I don't know if that's that well understood. There's two pieces of that, Grant. You're spot on. That that was core because we we had to hold the price or we couldn't build the kind of support we wanted either, right? If I was doing it at half the price, I couldn't hire great support engineers. I couldn't also have a CSM. I couldn't fund it the way we needed to. But the other part was we really did have to be really good. Like we actually had to give them something. We had to be a little bit like either stick with us or don't stick with us. It's your choice. We think we're really good at what we do. We want to earn your business. We want to give it to you at a really good. And as long as we were, it wasn't hard to renew people. It was like, you guys are one of the better values, right? You're, you're giving me great support. Our MPS was off the charts. Like it was always eight or nine, you know, as people were like, yeah, you guys, you know, you went that extra mile. You got me the root cause analysis. You talked to my economic buyer. You've done these, these small little steps that just made sure that the customer, when they were having their worst day of the year, everything went smoothly for them and you took care of them really well. But the other part I think that also helped with that is, you know, not being a slave to a number of customers that are super individually high percentage of your revenue. Like we never had a single customer more than two or 3% of our total revenue. You know, if that, like I, I would say that helped a lot. There was never one customer that they, we couldn't afford to lose. Like if a customer just said, Hey, take it or leave it. We could leave it and say, you know, we're not going to still work with you. And cause we weren't doing $5 million upfront, two year, three year contracts to make AT&T successful or something, right? We were doing a lot of start with 100k start with 150k start with 200k grow it grow it grow it and by the time they were growing it they had learned to like us so we never lost customers once they really started growing but if somebody was you know this one customer that i'm thinking of if they were like hey you know 100k or nothing it was easy to be like well you know your 100k isn't going to make or break us as a company whether we make it or not so i don't need your 100k i'm going to make my number i'm going to beat my number without that so having a strong business where you're you're doing that. And, and that was part of our, this helped with our board. We were very, you know, I wouldn't say conservative, but we were very pragmatic with our board. We always, you know, Shang is by his nature, a CEO who's very, very realistic. You know, he tends to underplay the upside and overplay the downside, really focus on the challenges and the business and the, the things that are disadvantaging to us versus the advantages we have. And so, you know, we were, we never got into that like unicorn bubble either where the expectations were so out of whack with what we could deliver that when we were, you know, doubling or growing by two and a half, three times a year, it was really, really good. And people were just thrilled. They were just like, wow, you guys are way outperforming, you know, what you thought, where you thought you might be at this year. And so we, we kept expectations in line and then delivered ahead of them, you know, almost the entire, I think the whole time, the entire time we had the company, we just were very realistic in our goals. And we never tried to oversell our investors. You know, even when we were raising money, we were super negative. We'd be out there pitching and we'd be like, yeah, but, you know, boom, boom, which I think, you know, probably depressed our value at some level. Maybe it cost us a few points, but it made the VCs that came in very much the ones who were like us. They were pragmatic. They were, you know, a little more seasoned. They weren't necessarily fighting to get into the deal. They felt like it was a fair, again, it was just kind of our nature. It was sort of be really clear, really upfront, 
for us, it worked really well. It allowed me to do all this as a dad of three kids and still not lose my mind and not, you know, not be in a position where I couldn't balance my life. Right. And, and sort of do all this stuff and still be happy because I think that's the challenge. Sometimes you get all this success and things are going really well, but you're just, you know, you're flying 250,000 miles a year. You're just nonstop every single minute you miss out on coaching soccer and you miss out on seeing the kids play and you miss out on, you know, keeping a reasonable balance with your parents as they get older and wanting to be around them. And I don't know, for me, it was really important. Maybe it's because I don't know, 20 years of working at startups. Like at some point, every day can't be the most important day. You have to get to some sense of like, <laughs> it's life. Like this is the only thing I've ever known since I graduated from college. So <laughs> that if you can't balance it all together and come up with a plan that's rational and logical and predictable and, and allows you to sort of, I don't know, it's very hard to keep doing it, right? Because you just burn through all of that, whatever it is, all that, all that energy. So anyways, I, I found that, and that's where finding the right partner, I mean, Shang was the perfect partner for me because he was, all, we're both really pragmatic and we're both sort of err on the side of seeing the problems instead of getting blown away with the potential. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> my my co-founder and I also also like have this like thing where I think one of the more important things about being a good founder is I say like being just super even keel, like you can't let the highs get you too high or the lows get you too low. And because like, in when things go bad, you have to be like, well, it'll, it'll get better. And when things are going uh, really well, you're like, what's going to go wrong next, right? Like, there's always like, <laughs> you can't last like this forever. And so there's this balance that you have to have. And I think it's because, it, you know, it's like, starting a company is kind of manic. And so you have to be just like as even as possible in order to, to manage it. Um, COVID made that interesting. But, uh, you know, that was like being like, you know, on a roller coaster with a manic person who's like screaming in your face and you're like, what's going on? Uh, <laughs> but, but we, you know, it sounds like, you know, you, you got through it. We got through it. It's a really interesting, interesting challenge. And you know, one, one thing I want to come back to that you said earlier that I, I cause I, I've been thinking about it a bit. You, you mentioned like a customer advisory board that you built. Is that something you were involved in? Yeah. Yeah. Heavily. We've built one. We've, we've kind of found it to be really useful and they, they really, tend to be this great opportunity, especially in a, you know, in a company of our size, right. And you're, you're in kind of that mid ground where maybe you've got hundreds mm -hmm. of customers, but not thousands of customers where you can, you can kind of identify the customers in your, in your install base that are very thought leadering, whatever that word is, sure. <laughs> they show a lot of thought leadership. <laughs> and so where you really, you know, they're the kind of, the, you know, everyone's got this, right. They've got the 20 or 30 customers that they just know better than they know their other customers. They're ones that they've personally spent a lot of time with. They may be early customers. They may be really strategic customers or they're, they're your biggest customers, but they could just be your smartest customers. You know, we've had some great ones. I mean, we have some great ones in, in all sorts of parts of the industry from insurance companies to automotive companies to government agencies to tech startups and everything else. And so um, we just found that by bringing them together, on a semi-regular basis, we got to, you know, we got to get some really honest feedback and we also got them a little more comfortable, you know, especially in the early days, like, they, you know, they're working with Rancher, right? They're working with a small company that doesn't, you know, they chose us over Red Hat, right? There's people in their organization just almost wanting them to fail mm. or saying like, what were you thinking? Why would you do this? You know, there's, you know, Google's on knocking on their door, VMware's knocking on their door. And so you want them to feel a little bit more comfortable too, that they're in good hands and that other people have made the same choice. And they're like, oh, wow. So these guys are here too. And these guys are here and these guys are, oh, wow. All right. And so that was, that was a big part of our success was just getting all these companies together and just making them feel more comfortable. In fact, in many cases, you know, we would win departmentally, we would win functionally, we'd be the, the solution for a part of their business. I mean, one of the really biggest financial services companies we work for, you know, we were working with, uh, you know, a part of their stack and the rest of it was all Pivotal. And then, you know, Pivotal was kind of losing traction on the PaaS side. So they started using VMware's you know, Kubernetes mm. story and, uh, and that struggled, you know, then we were brought in to compete, but there was a big red hat group. So they went to open shift for another six months that failed, you know, but our team kept supporting us and kept pushing us forward and saying like, I know you guys don't, you know, you don't trust that this smaller company can work for a company that's, you know, one of the 20 biggest companies in the world, but 
they're killing it for our applications. We're the happiest group here. We're running Kubernetes longer and more successful than anyone else. You really should look at them. You know, we brought some of the other executives to one of our advisory boards. They're able to see, oh, you know, also, you know, this huge organization, this huge organization has all in, this bank has gone all in. This, And it was that that gave them the comfort finally to, you know, to kick those other products out and just standardize and do a much, much bigger deal and a much bigger expansion. But it was, you know, we were passed over twice, you know, when they decided to go to Kubernetes, despite success in a department, because we were, you know, at the time we were maybe 60 people. And then we were probably, the second time we were probably 120 people. And the third time we were 250 people. But you kind of have to get used to that as a startup. You have to be comfortable, you know, holding your ground, sometimes losing out to bigger competitors who have deep relationships, who are able to give away the product that is in your space as part of a renewal and a much bigger deal. So, it's almost you're competing against free, despite the fact that long term that product's going to be way more expensive. You're, you know, you're asking for money up front, where they're giving them basically, you know, the whole kitchen sink to try to lock them in on this new platform. I mean, we see that still today all the time, and you just have to, you know, hold your value, believe you're you've got a great story and a great product. No, you're not going to win the whole market. Accept that, you know, other people will pick up other customers and make sure that you're you're winning more and more and more and more of your share. And that things like a customer advisory board really helped. I mean, they just help because they give people confidence. Yeah. And so how, how do you, I mean, you, you formalize it, you have it, you know, once a quarter, how do you pick who from the, the customer to be on the, on the advisory board? You know, it's just like pretty easy. It's, you know, the, the CSMs make recommendations, the, the salespeople make recommendations, the support people talk about the bright people. And we, you know, we didn't set a hard limit. We kind of said, oh, let's go for 10. And then we ended up with 30. You know, we said like, oh, we'll, we'll start small. And before you knew it, it was 30 people. And, you know, we never were big enough to have like a rancher fest or a rancher con or whatever. So we would do it at KubeCon. So mm-hmm. we'd be like, hey, why don't you come to KubeCon and come the day early, come spend, you know, some time with us in a hotel next door and we'll really get into the weeds on our roadmap. And, um, you know, we always were big sponsors of KubeCon, so we'd have extra passes and we'd offer them passes. So it was, you know, they still had to fly themselves out there, but they would get some value out of coming to a KubeCon and, you know, meeting us, going out to a great dinner, sitting and learning and talking to other people. We do one in Europe and one in the U.S. since we tied them to the KubeCons and they were, they were great. Um, we haven't done one in person now. We've been doing virtual ones and we made those even bigger where we've kind of expanded them even more. So I don't know what we're going to do when COVID ends and we kind of bring it back together. At this point, though, we're, you know, SUSE has SUSEcon. So yeah. we'll have our own conference that people are coming to that will probably start to, to drive these kind of conversations to. But I still think the place we want to be talking to them is during KubeCon, right? When they're thinking about this stuff and they're really, you know, this is top of mind for them. They're able to get a lot of education and we can also put a lot of stuff into context for them that they usually appreciate. But like, what's the profile? Do you, do you look for the, executive the manager the like you know the 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 hands-on keyboard person like who's the it's usually the architect and the economic buyer so often we'll bring two people from a customer we'll invite them both oh interesting if it's if we're going with just one you know it might be somebody who kind of fits both sometimes there's an economic buyer and an architect kind of character but we never wanted to be too restrictive i mean you know again they were usually the cost of this is not going to break the bank for a a funded startup, right? It's more important to make them really comfortable. And so, yeah, we would invite sometimes two people from the same company. We try to keep it at that because you start all of a sudden you'd have, you know, these, these big companies would want to bring seven people to, to your advisory board. And you're like, you're going to overwhelm the rest of everyone else. So we sort of capped it at two, but we would also, you know, try to be flexible and, and let them bring different people, different times. It wasn't meant to be a exclusive, like some, some people would have one person attend in the U.S. and a different person attend in Europe because they were global companies. Sure. So we might have you know the same company in two different geos. But yeah, we never really got it off the ground in Asia. I mean, we had customers from Asia who would come to the U.S. one, but Asia we never we never got to the point of getting a customer's advisory board. We're just now starting to build one out in Asia. Oh, cool! So twice a year was the the right cadence for us. It was yeah. I mean, we would do a virtual one and then a in person one. So it was twice a year for each geo. So we do a virtual Europe, in person Europe, virtual US, in person US. Okay, so really four a year then, I guess. Yeah, cool. But they were kind of mirrored, so we try to do the in person one. You know, because the cube cons were kind of split, so they were they were really it was kind right. of like two a year in the sense of we would do the virtual one for Europe when we did the regular one in the US and and vice versa. Oh, okay. 
but it wouldn't be virtual and together together right it'd be like not at the same time but just sort of the same content right so we weren't creating uh, because you know we wanted to tie it to our our store like hey here's what's coming here's what we're we usually had a lot of questions we wanted to get feedback on so and they were naturally about six months apart so it was it was kind of a good way to do it where we'd have a north america and a, and a european version yeah okay that makes a lot of sense and then like who owned that was that your like customer success leader dave yeah, it was Dave and and our marketing team kind of helped a ton. Okay. I mean, Pete Smales, our VP of marketing, was fantastic. CMO, he he did everything. You know, he's the kind of guy that just never said no, and he would take it on. He would run, he would run anything, any crazy idea we'd come up with. He was all in, and you know, making sure they had hoodies and, and notebooks and all the likes. But yeah, it was some combination of our Connie, our amazing event manager, and Pete and Dave would pull it off together. Got it. Yeah, that's super helpful. I, I, you know, this is like, I, I always say that I imagine these conversations is like us having coffee together. And this is just something I've been thinking about <laughs> recently. So I'm like, oh, I want to, I want to dive deep on that. But I, hopefully, you know, other folks uh, are, you know, are thinking about that as well. I mean, a, any other like kind of insights or, or, you know, kind of things that you, you think about a, a good customer advisory board, like what it accomplishes or best ways to run it? Any other tips? No, I think the big thing is just try to be consistent. It's hard. You got other priorities start to bubble up. You know, don't be afraid to reach out to them on the fly. You know, reach out to them with an email, reach out with a note, just saying, hey, what's going on? Don't think that your customer advisory board is sort of sufficient for communicating with all of your customers, right? So your customer advisory board is one thing, but that doesn't mean you don't also need customer webinars, right? Like customer advisory board is a subset, but there's you know, usually 10 times as many customers who aren't on your advisory board, make sure you're not under communicating to them and thinking you're doing a great job by talking to your advisory board. So we have to run, you know, there we run Zooms and we run, you know, different content, maybe, maybe a little bit more roadmap content that's a little closer and a little less discussion capable when you have 500 people on a Zoom versus 30 people in a room. But it's not sufficient to just run a customer advisory board. The customer advisory board is is more about getting into the weeds a little bit and also getting them talking. You know, your job there is to present for no more than like one of the great things that a customer advisory board is to have a customer present. So typically we'll present for a bit, then you'll have one or two customers share their journey and talk about what their big challenges are, things they're worried about in the future, you know, how adoption is going and that gets people talking. So a little bit, the less we talk, the better in a customer advisory board. That's not the case when you're talking one to many in a big customer update you know those we would do in a more you know more like a webinar i would say one of the big things we kind of uncovered on you know we used to go to webinars our tool in all the online meetups we called them online meetups we never called them webinars we do these online meetups and the thing we realized was that we always had people on the team whose job it was to answer questions in real time and so we would get one of the biggest challenges you're out there presenting, it's hard to kind of engage and you can't really do Q and Q and a sucks on zooms and stuff, but we found that the chat function or the Q and a function in there, if you responded really fast and you published the response out to the whole audience, you got incredibly more questions and then engagement went way up. Mm. So we, we just, I think I figured that out on like the first online meetup we did all the way back in 2015 was that I could hit reply to all anytime, any question practically came in that was at all interesting. And I would, you know, thank the person for the questions, you know, Darren might be presenting and I'm just banging out responses and it became I mean, we would get 500 questions over the course of a two hour thing. It was insane. People were just like, well, what about this? What about this? I don't understand. And then you got people like almost like firing back and forth answers to other people's questions. I'm not sure that's quite right. You know, and you're like, oh, really? Click replace. And it would go back and it would start more conversation. And, and so it was almost like turning, it was like I always said, I wish Zoom and Slack were one thing when you did a webinar because I want, I want people like heavily engaged if they're going to come to this thing. And that engagement was value that brought them back. So they would come back. And that was, it was even more so when you're talking about your customer thing, like, Hey, we're showing some new feature. Well, is that going to be for this? Does that work like this? What if we're on this version? Well, we need to upgrade to this. And it's like those questions, somebody else might be thinking them. So you just, by replying to all and you just get everybody sucked in and all of a sudden what was a, you know, kind of dull one directional presentation where someone else is probably on ESPN, you know, checking out a baseball score is now, you know, firing really fast, but you're not interrupting the flow of the information that you're trying to give out there because otherwise you open it up to real live questions and it just, the whole thing grinds to a stop. So that was, that was our one little, you know, how to make these things interactive was all about the reply to all feature in, uh, in go to webinar. (laughs) I love that too, because it creates a reason to show up 
in real time and like be a part of the uh, the live event because generally there's not much incentive. And if I can consume something an hour or two days later at 2x speed on YouTube, it's preferable. Yeah. But if I know that I'm going to be able to really get questions answered and be part of like a broader conversation that's happening, then I will show up like at 10 a.m. PST, you know, on Tuesday for that, you know, like virtual meetup. That's that's really good. You know, one of the things we, we did too was this was kind of, I would say, in the height of Meetup. Like, remember, Meetup.com was really popular at the time, and it was sort of, yeah. which is, it's kind of waned a bit in the time. But we we had this great slide at the very beginning of our monthly online Meetup where we said, "Hey, just so you know, it's an online Meetup. This is not a webinar. It'll be not a webinar thing. What that means is we only come when we're ready to talk about tech stuff. So we we come here to demo. It's all live demos, no canned demos. We record. We you know we'll record it, but because of that crap breaks. So just get used to stuff's going to break." We won't leave until all your questions are answered, you know, way less PowerPoint and way more demo. We, you know, we will have the technical experts will be the people here talking. And it was like, Mm-mm. we made that commitment to the customer. Then we did a hashtag where you would just hashtag Rancher Meetup on Twitter and start posting. And one of the things we got people to do was just post a picture of you and what you're doing as you watch the meetup and it was just a stupid type of thing, but it became viral and people were, you know, people posting from their car. I'm listening in my car in Sweden at two in the morning or something. And, you know, we'd have people posting like their whole team getting pizza and eating pizza and watching it from their office. And it was just like month after month, you know, this just post a picture. So we, till we had, and we'd always have a slide where we put the new ones that came in the previous months. So we had a slide with maybe, you know, a thousand, 500 tweets of people, how they participated, but it was those little things that made it, this is a community. We can't do real, especially when you're small, it's really hard to have like, like Docker could have global meetups all over the world and everybody would come and do this in person. But we're, we weren't that big. We were sort of a small company and our community was good size, but only if you could virtualize it, only if I could take them all and have them show up virtually, especially in the early days. And that, that worked so much better because we had a number of people try to start like rancher meetups in Paris and rancher meetups in London and and they always fizzled out. There just weren't, you know, you couldn't bring 200 people or 150 people to a, an in-person event once every month or two, um, and get enough good content especially if you were the London organizer of some meetup, whereas you maybe could on for a Kubernetes meetup, right? Like a Kubernetes meetup, right. you could get enough content. There were enough people who wanted to present and talk and enough vendors who wanted to talk. And this, and so being virtual helped us build that same sort of camaraderie with maybe a more smaller but very passionate group of people. And honestly, probably better to consume after the fact too because it was presented virtually, not presented in person. So it's like it's sort of made for later consumption. Yeah, exactly. One of the things we realized, we just put it all on YouTube, right? We put everything up to yeah. YouTube, but you know, we put in call to actions in the YouTube videos, and those became really good lead generators. Um, later, we started yeah, like putting, add add a button in the video, like at that certain yeah, timestamp and yeah. stuff. I mean, oh, I personally brilliant. was doing the figuring this stuff out on the fly. <laughs> Grant was like, "How do you add a button to a YouTube video to <laughs> download the product? Like, hey, download this thing. It's right here. Here's yeah. how you pull it. Here, get to the GitHub page for you know K three S or whatever it was. We were we were pitching and promoting and yeah, it was just all that, you know, all that hacky stuff is what, I don't know, if you're a founder, that's the stuff that's super fun. At least for me, that's the memories I have that are so good about it is just, you know, and and like we just kept adding in planks. I kept thinking of marketing to me as this house you were building and it was like, you know, the online meetup would be like your floor and you kept that floor. You didn't stop doing that, but it wasn't sufficient. Then you had to add walls. So you'd start doing these weekly you know, deep dive trainings for new users. And then you'd have to add a ceiling. So you'd start adding a uh, partner meetup. So we started doing every month a masterclass with some partner where it was like, or, mm. or some open source project and we'd bring them in to pitch something so we could add more value to our community. And then we'd start adding, you know, things like um, we had something called a rodeo, which was like a two and a half hour deep, deep, deep technical process that was in person at first and, and then later became virtual. But these rancher rodeos, we've now had probably, I don't know, 20,000 people attend Rancher Rodeos, which are wow. half day, you know, deep dives on building your company's Kubernetes platform. And, you know, 40 people in all, all during eight second presentations. <laughs> Unfortunately, no, no, these are you know, the rodeo. Eight, eight seconds is like how long you're supposed to ride. The no, no, for. I, yeah, I got gotcha. you. Yeah. No, it's uh, unfortunately the rodeos were like we'd have to put two engineers on them because so many people would come and they'd be trying. We had to build a product to make the rodeos work. We had to build this thing. Uh, hobby farm we had to build an open source project you can google it github rancher hobby farm to do build like 
30 people showing up in a room. Okay, now I've got to give them all rancher environments in the cloud working. Oh, funny. And so we built a whole product to make this work. The, uh, our field engineer, we have the best field engineering team. They are so good. Uh, Chris Irwin just built a, a team of absolute, insane, amazing field engineers who just, like they built products, they built code, they would go out there and do things. They were much more technical than any SE team I'd ever worked with. Like we, mm. we didn't really hire, cause again, it was Kubernetes in the early days. We couldn't just hire a, somebody coming out of, you know, having been an SE at VMware, they wouldn't know Kubernetes. So we hired people right out of the community, people that knew this stuff cold. And uh, that was all really, really fun. I love that. It's also, you can tell like Rancher did marketing well because you care about it, but it's also like, there's just so much bad marketing in enterprise software. And so if you, if you really care about it and you take some amount of like almost like a consumer marketing sort of perspective to some of these things, you can stand out heads and shoulders above everybody else. It's so true. And it's funny, the little things, you're so right, because like when I think back at what we did well, it's definitely a lot of the marketing, the model, the product, but even the things like the name. I mean, just being rancher was sort of, you know, everything in our space was 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 not ocean yeah, oriented, yeah. right? Like everything was, yeah. it was nautical. And we were like this weirdly bizarre cow company that, <laughs> but it was catchy and people could remember it. And they always, you know, they were like, yeah, I think I've heard of these guys. What, who the hell are they? And so being just a little bit quirky and different sometimes goes a long way to breaking out of them. Because there's just so many companies. You think about a KubeCon with 300 vendors trying to get your attention. It's hard. It's hard to break out. And so, you know, for us, being a little bit of a zig to everyone else's zag worked pretty well. Yeah. It's, it's a grind. You just work at it every day. You get it all right and it, it pays off. The other funny thing is you've like referenced how big Docker like is slash was or, you know, throughout this, you're like, oh, we weren't as big as Docker. And it's like, and, you know, obviously Rancher has had a much better outcome than, than they had at Docker. Obviously Docker's still kind of, you know, chugging along and they recapped, but like you became the like bigger brand and bigger company than Docker, you know, did, which is, which is funny because you kind of think about how high flying that was and you're talking about you're pragmatic and small and growing, but eventually, you know, it's like the tortoise and the hare kind of thing, right? Well, for them, it was, I mean, they were, they had such an innovative piece of technology. I mean, Solomon and the oh, team was so genius yeah. that I guess for, to me, I always think of what we did as small fries compared to the impact of creating Docker. Oh, okay, sure. But I definitely would say, that that pragmatic sort of steady approach on the business side helped us in a market that was super dynamic because i mean you know but as well as anybody this market is dynamic it changed <laughs> yeah. a lot between 2014 and 2020 you know we must have pivoted multiple i think of i always think of us having pivoted twice like pivoted once to kubernetes and really like fully all in on kubernetes and then pivoting again to you know to really embracing kind of kubernetes without being a distro Right. Like even our first you look at our first distro, mm. our first Kubernetes business was a lot of I want to run Kubernetes on premise. I want to run Kubernetes on premise. Do you have a good distro? And we were really good at breaking Rancher, the product, away from our distro. So people could take our distro. But that was a pretty big pivot. I don't I think that was a that was a big moment when we said, if we can't add value to EKS, we have no long-term value in the market. Like that, when you start with that sort of premise at a technical level, you're saying like we can't add value to Amazon, we're we're hosed. It really challenges your thinking. I remember, you know, talking to someone at CoreOS actually about, you know, one of the reasons they sold to Red Hat was they weren't convinced they could add value on top of Amazon, that, that they could get there. And I think that was a fair point that they had a distro and it wasn't clear without, you know, but we always believed we could do something that was would sort of go above the distro level and build something there and build an open source product that, you know, our, our story was always, hey, if Docker's open source and Kubernetes open source, then the management plane should be open source. And we wanted to distinctly play in that management plane business without getting sucked down into it. But it was hard because the money was all in distros in the early days of selling this. Like it was like, I need a really good, reliable. And even today when people buy, often they're telling us, okay, I need you to support K3S here and RKE here and EKS here. And that's why we have so many nodes, right? The size and the scale of our infrastructure. So it's, you know, finding that value in a market where the cloud we know is going to be big is, is really tough. It's so interesting because we had to make such a similar pivot, right? Like where we had to extract the sort of admin console component of replicated away from our Kubernetes distro. And, and it's funny because sometimes people think that Rancher and replicated are competitive, but 
we, we do different things. Like, I, I'm not sure how much you know about our business, but like, we don't operate Kubernetes clusters. We like enable third party applications to bring their software into, you know, all these different environments. And so we had the same thought though. we have to be able to, you know, install into existing clusters and bring value on top of that existing cluster and bring value to both the IT admin who's managing these third party applications. And that's a bunch of different integrations and workflows, but also add value to the vendor when they're distributing their application into an EKS cluster or an OpenShift cluster or a Rancher cluster. You know, like we never really think about ourselves as like a Kubernetes distro company. We think about ourselves as like the third party, you know, Kubernetes application company. And so it's just this this interesting sort of parallels there, you know, and, and eventually you're like, yeah, like w- w- the whole point is to be compatible with the ecosystem and to work, you know, with Rancher and to work with, you know, EKS or OpenShift or whatever else is out there. It's so true. And, you know, Grant, I've, I've been a fan of what you guys have done for a long time because in a lot of ways it's just, it's very similar to us and the, the pragmatic approach. And like I was talking about back all the way back to cloud.com where, you know, at the end of the day, building a company is hard as hell. And if you can find a niche that you can cross into, then you have another chance, right? Like you can, you can keep going, you get to keep playing, you're not out at the table, right? The problem is is sometimes people don't get that and they make these huge bets and they, they have to be game changers. Everybody wants to be the next OS or the next, you know, platform, whatever it is. And that's great. And some, every once in a while people hit, but that's like the vast majority of face plants in venture funding are like, like yeah, it's going to be, oh shit, you know, sorry. <laughs> you know, that yeah, one. Right. And I, I love the, you know, like you guys carved out a really smart niche. Like, hey, a lot of these enterprise software vendors are going to need to distribute their software on Kubernetes. Like we can help them. We understand that. We can, you know, learn from what we learned the first one and then learn from the second one, the third one and become you know, we don't have to beat OpenShift or Ranch or anyone, right? We can be super differentiated in this yeah. group. And then who knows, right? What comes next? What comes after that? Where do we go from there? But it, it, it's all about getting that foothold, that chasm cross, especially when you're, you're sitting in a position where you're competing with companies that are just so much more well-funded, right? That's, you know, for, you know, I always think of us in that position, but you're in the same position, right? Yeah. Where you're looking and saying, you know, these companies are raising a hundred million dollars. How are we, you know, going to do that or it's google and amazon or somebody right yeah Yeah. exactly and that's sort of where i'm looking at it always from like oh docker they raised you know 500 million dollars mesosphere was valued at you know two billion and was you know laughed at you know would would never saw that that we would have any chance against these types of companies and um you know vcs told me you guys have no chance docker is is going to own everything in that layer you you're you're just absolutely going in the wrong direction and so you you have to be comfortable saying that's totally possible. Like what you're saying is totally possible, right. but we're going to go up for it. We we're here and we think there's an opportunity and you know, maybe we can execute really well because while executing companies that are pragmatic, that focus on very clear midterm objectives tend to be successes. You know, they may not be the unicorn successes, but they tend to be really good successes. And I, I tend to have a lot of respect for companies that build good business, build actual pragmatic customer base. They tend to, do it again and again and they grow from there so yeah I, i'm i'm a big fan i think you guys are right on the right spot and i think you're going to keep keep making smart decisions like that well thank you very much I, I i definitely appreciate that uh and i think we have the same approach just like you have to be very long-term oriented right like this idea you're talking about of like customers that you know don't choose you and you lose out multiple times and eventually you win it's because you're long-term oriented and you're saying look we're gonna be here you can work with us when, whenever you figure out that, that approach isn't right, and you want to come here. Like we'll be here to work with you, and we won't hold it against you. Like we will very happily, you know, take your money then and help you get successful, and, and you'll be a, you know, we'll create a success story. And and it's both like this that approach from like a a mentality, right? Like our team, we always try to be very long term oriented. I think it's really important the relationships that you build the way that you treat people. And, you know, I want to look back in 20 years still running this company and say like, yeah, we, you know, people love working with us because this whole time we've really created a lot of success and we've never, you know, been short term and tried to, you know, get the extra nickel or dime here. So makes perfect sense, man. I think you're, you're taking the right approach. That's all we have time for today. If you're interested in being a guest on this show, or if you'd like to suggest a topic, or just to learn more about enterprise features, find us at enterpriseready.io. To learn more about Heavybit, visit heavybit.com to check out the library. 
It's packed with amazing talks on sales, marketing, product, and general management from founders of developer tools companies and other industry leaders. This podcast is also brought to you by my company, Replicated, where we enable cloud-native software vendors like HashiCorp, CircleCI, Sneak, and many others to operationalize and scale the distribution of their modern on-prem applications to the largest enterprise customers. Check us out at replicated.com.